All right, welcome back, and as promised, here it is reassembled now with out the hub shell. So you can kind of see now what the internals are comprised of. Most of the internals are taken up by the two clutches. There's the high speed driving clutch, and there's the low speed driving clutch. Here's the piece that um, presses against the uh, brake shoes. Here's the um, brake shoe discs. And then there's the ball bearings for the left side of the um, hub. Inside the hub shell are two tapers. I'll point them out to you here. This is the taper that the um, high-speed clutch engages, and then this is the taper that the low-speed clutch engages. And as you can see it right now, the hub is set up for the high-speed side to drive. The tabs on the clutch on the shifting mechanism are in the slots here on the high-speed clutch so the high-speed clutch is free to travel up its driving screw to the right as far as it will go and of course with the um, with it disassembled it's gonna bottom out against that shoulder there on the right hand uh, ball race but that would be the high speed driving position and then the low speed clutch simply sits there and continues to freewheel along but it will not engage the um, hub shell to switch gears we'll have to back up the pedals and I'll flip this around here so turn it back enough that it will when turning forward pick up and engage okay now the little fingers on the sequencer that's the word I was looking for earlier now these little fingers here on the sequencer are in a position where they block the high speed clutch from moving to the right as far as it will go. See the finger there? So now this high speed clutch cannot move to the right as far as it can go and so the low speed clutch then is able to travel over and engage its taper on the inside of the hub shell. Now for braking, braking always occurs through the low speed, so it always occurs through the gears. And because of that, you get uh, torque multiplication through the gearing because the sprocket is attached to the ring gear and the low speed driving screw is driven through the planet carrier you get torque multiplication um, on that screw pressing its driving clutch to the left to compress the brake disc stack and that's what affects the braking In order for these clutches to be able to travel up and down their screws to the left and to the right, they have to be held stationary with respect to the rotating screws, and that's what these um, drag springs do. There's a drag spring right here, and there's a coupling spring which couples that drag spring mount, uh, that's keyed to um, the stationary brake discs 
drag spring, uh, coupler couples that spring to the low speed clutch, and then a second coupler couples to another spring to the high speed clutch. If I flip this around here, you can see the high speed clutch is made just like the um, drag spring is, the coupling spring. The reason there is a spring here on the high speed clutch is so that the low speed clutch and the high speed clutch can move at differential speeds. There has to be a slip point there. But you also need to be able to transfer that stationary move, um, force to the high speed clutch. So that's why there has to be a second drag spring. So this is the primary drag spring which energizes everything else and this is the secondary drag spring which allows the high speed clutch to always overrun the low speed clutch. It's a major disadvantage of all coaster brakes that there has to be a frictional element there to activate the clutches. Since the clutches operate on a threaded driver the driving screws to make it work. There has to be some drag component there to, to cause that to be able to run right or left on its respective screws. And so that has always been a major uh, defect, if you will, of the coaster brake design that while pedaling or braking there is a uh, drag. Now in, in freewheeling there is no drag other than the drag of the bearings but while you're pedaling there is always the drag of this um, drag spring and in the case of this there's always um, the drag on this spring in addition to the main drag spring because these are always operating at a differential speed of each other regardless of which one is driving they're always operating at whatever the ratio is between the low and the high gear. So that's a major uh, defect of all coaster brake designs. Not really any satisfactory way of getting around that. We're using a coaster brake design as long as you're using this type of drive system with the screws. And the only, th the only um, way around it is to design the brake in such a way that the um, drag is as minimized as possible and uh, most of these designs try to do that the drag on these is just enough that the um, clutch will remain stationary so that it can ride up or down on its respective driving screw to either engage and drive or disengage and brake. And in fact, because the drag of the um, spring is not positive, in order to ensure sufficient um, drag so that this does not rotate with the driving screw under heavy load, the um, surfaces where they come in contact for braking have these um, knurled teeth here so that once this makes contact with that that forms a positive lock so that as braking pressure is applied this does not slip under that pressure when driving in the forward direction uh, that's part of the reason why these um, cones are knurled here is so that once that makes contact the, the drive is positive alright well I'm glad you all uh, followed along with me on this little detour um, seems like it's the appropriate time of the year to start talking about outdoorsy type activities and bicycle parts and that's just another one of my many interests so I'm sure we'll see other videos in this vein in the future. This is obviously the first series. And uh, thank you for watching. Uh, 
If you have any questions or comments, feel uh, free to leave them, and uh, I might do a future video um, digging deeper if necessary. But this is Oklahoma Bridges signing out. Thank you.